So just to go ahead and pick up from last week, we were talking about the, the, the concept of Virul Walidain. And as I mentioned, we're going to be using the book of Sheikh Muhammad Mulud, who was about from 150 years ago in Mauritania. And his focus was on creating a curriculum of subjects that have practical implementation and are things that occur on a daily basis. So every one of us have parents, whether they're living or, or passed away, and we have to know how to interact with them. We went over the idea of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran that He has joined between the order for Tawheed, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ إِلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا and the order towards righteousness or bid towards the parents. Those two orders are together. And Ibn Abbas mentions that there's three orders in the Quran. I, the third one had slipped my mind last week, so I wanted to mention it. But there are three orders that Allah had mentioned as dual orders. And he said that to complete, to have the a fulfillment of these orders, you have to do both. So those are Allah wa Rasul. It's, it's usually they're together. So a person cannot say, oh, I only follow Allah and the Quran. I don't need other than that, as some people wrongly believe. No, the order is Allah wa Rasul. To fully implement this rule, you have to follow both. Aqimu salah wa atu zikr. Establish the prayer and give zakah. So those are both together. A person can't say, oh, I'll just give, uh, uh, do salah. I don't need to do zakah. And then the third one, which relates to also to this topic that we're discussing, the righteousness, bitter walidain, is anashkur li wali walidain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, show shukr, give thanks to me and to your parents. And he, Muhammad Maulud is going to talk later on in the text. He says, look at this order. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say, uh, li wali right? He didn't say, have shukr to me and to your shaykh. He didn't say, have shukr to me and to your husband or your wife. He didn't say, have shukr to me and to your best friend, to your business partner, to anybody else. The only person. And he mentions this later on in the text. He said, I've gone through the Quran and I've reflected on it. The only time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned somebody along with him for shukr is with your parents. So there's a deep lesson there. There's a, there's a secret there. Um, and, you know, we'll, by the time we get to the end of the text, one of the things that I found is that once we go through all of this, one of the, 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 the questions that comes up at the, by the end of the text, they say, okay, I get it, I get it. We have to, you know... Um, uh, respect our parents. And to show you the impact of this book specifically. This book is about 80 lines of poetry, 80 lines of poetry. It can be taught over a period of a few weeks, a few days, and sometimes I've rushed through it and gone through it in about two hours, like an intensive. One time, Allah al I was giving this, uh, this, this, this class in San Diego. A man had walked by, had heard a little bit of the dust. It caught his attention. He stood in the doorway and leaned up against the wall. And you know, sometimes people walk by a halaqa, they listen to a little bit, and then they walk after five or ten minutes. He stood there for about two hours. You know, I guess he didn't get the, the feeling, oh gosh, I'm, I'm here to stay, so let me just sit down and join the halaqa. But after two hours, after the class, he came up to me and he said, he said, you know what? I have not spoken to my father in 16 years out of sheer hatred. And at that point, what do you say? I didn't know, I didn't have any words to say to him. So I just looked at him and he said, again, after going through this text, he said, I think it's time I give him a call. That's the impact of, of, of what this book has had. Another person uh, had actually flown across the country to attend a series of lectures. The first lecture they gave was this book. It was another teacher teaching the same exact book. And they had left their home and their mother had told them, their mother, one of their parents had said, I don't really want you going to that, um, to that convention or that, uh, that setting. And so he disobeyed his mother and he went to anyways, I'm going to study Islam. And Muhammad Mulud later, he's going to talk about when you have to obey your parents and when you can disobey them, when they tell you not to, not to go out for travel, for business, for study, for uh, or whatever, whatever it might be. He came, the first lesson was this lesson, and then he got on the next plane and went home. He realized the impact. Another person, after having gone through this text, he came up to me, he said, I live in the same apartment with my father, and I have not spoken to him for six months. 
Nothing. No, no words, no exchanges. And they live in the same apartment. And after going, this, uh, going through this book, he said, I think it's time that I mend the relationship. So that's the power when, when these, these verses from the Quran and the tafsir that is mentioned about these verses and the ahadith, it's all put together. It's like an extract. Sheikh Muhammad Mulut looked at all of the various tafsir, looked at the ayats in the Quran, looked at the ahadith, and brought them all together. So he's going to talk more about this, this, this concept of shukr and what it really means. One of the ulama said that there, I mean, there's many ways that we can show shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes we, 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 we forget the subtle differences between some of these concepts. So for example, we say alhamdulillah, and we say shukru lillah. You know, what is the difference? Shukr and hamd. What is the difference between the two? The ulama said, alhamdu bil lisan wa shukru bil janan. Hamd, praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with the tongue. We praise Him, we say Alhamdulillah, alayhi bil jameel, whatever type of praise is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But shukr, like praising Allah and thanking Allah is not only with the tongue. It's like, you know, if, if somebody comes up and says, oh, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. You might say, well, show it, you know, show it in your actions, show it, especially for those of you who are parents, right? You know, it's like, oh, thank you, thank you, mom, thank you, dad, thank you, baba, abu, you know. It's like, no, I want you to show me your thanks, right? So the shukr is with the, 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 with your blessings of Allah and your, your body. Anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you that, you, that you use that for the sake of Allah. So shukr of the eyes, shukr of the hands, you know, just think of any, you could, we could use anything for the haram or for the halal. We can use it for the wajib and we can use it for the, the disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So shukr is using the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his sake. So there's many different ways that we can show shukr. But one of the main ways the ulama said that we show shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by doing our five daily prayers. That's a consistent way. So one of the ulama made a qiyas, he said, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects from us these five daily prayers as a bare minimum shukr, then we should be making dua, uh, supplication for our parents at least five times a day. So those are the three orders in the Quran that are dual orders. Um, and then... Um, he also mentions a hadith, he says, Sallallahu ala man qala inna rida ilahina ta'ala. Um, according to a hadith, uh, mentioned in Sunan Tirmidhi, Rida Allah fi rida al-walidayn. Wa safatu Allah fi safatu al-walidayn. That the rida, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is in the pleasure of the parents, and the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in the anger of the parents. Now this is a very, very heavy hadith, because it's, it's almost like the reaction that your parents give to you is an indication of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for you. Do you have the riba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have jannah and tawab? Or do we have the, the sakhaf of Allah, the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we have the Allah, we seek um, uh, refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, from, from, from his anger. And we know in other ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, such as in the Salat al Janazah, one of the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted this person is we look at that Janazah. And we see, and how many of us have been to the cemetery, and we see a huge Jama'ah bringing one of the Janazahs there, 40, 50, 60, 100, 200 people. And then a, very shortly after, we see another Janazah with four or five people. Has, has anybody witnessed that? Over here at the Maqbara or any of the Maqabah? And then SubhanAllah, sometimes those Janazahs that have a lot of people, the people actually help that family. Wallahi, I was at a janazah one time over here in Livermore. The, fam the second family did not have enough people to carry their relative from the car to the place of burial. And the janazah of the first person, he ended up because there were so many people, he had three janazahs. There was one where they did the ghusl in Fremont. There was one where they prayed, the, the, people, the people were actually fighting over where his janazah was going to be and where his ghusl was going to be. And that's a sign that like how much people love him. So I came, they, they came to me and the family said, no, we wanted it in this masjid. And the community that he used to go said, no, we want it in this masjid. So the, 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 the amends that I made between them, I said, okay, can we do the ghusl at this masjid? And then they carry him, they do the janazah at this other masjid, and then they go to the maqbara. Uh, and they accepted that. Um, but then they ended up, there were so many people that wanted to pray the janazah, they prayed at his, at his grave. Hundreds of people at each janazah. 
And then right after that, a Janaza, they didn't have enough people to take the body from the car to the place of burial. And other people from that Janaza came and helped out. And we said, SubhanAllah, this man was helpful to people in, while he was alive. And even after he had passed away, the, the, the traces of his khidmah to, to, to the Muslims was still going, his service to the Muslims. So we know that there's, a, um, there's an indication of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's exception or rejection of a person in the exception or rejection of, of, of the people. So this is when we hear this hadith. Now at the same time, it has to be balanced out. As I was mentioning last week, our deen, the sharia of the, of the Prophet sallallahu is very clear. Granted, there are, there are matters that are uh, that are ambiguous and we have to make a uh, make an ijtihad and figure out what exactly is the application here But for the most part it's very clear. Our prayer is very clear. Our fast is very clear The qira'ah of the Quran is very clear. The, uh, all of our deen is, is very clear So we don't want parents to read this hadith and say oh That means anytime I get mad at my son. Oh, you better watch out because if I'm mad Allah's mad and you have to make me happy at all costs uh, because if you don't make me happy, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not happy with you. And that's not what we want. We want a balance. And uh, in, once we get into the discussion, we, we'll, we, we'll see more of a definition of what does that mean? How much do I have to do to make my parents happy? And at what point am I not doing anything wrong, even if they're angry with me? So I'm skipping some of the lines. Again, I'll share this book um, with, uh, with everyone. He also uh, mentions, um, he said the, the importance, he's talking about the importance of the hadith. And I mean in the Quran and the hadith, it's also wajib, it's an obligation in the Quran, in the sunnah, and according to the consensus of the ulama, the ijma of the ulama. There's very few matters that you'll find that the obligation is clearly mentioned at these three levels. It's clear in the Quran, it's clear in the hadith, it's, and the scholars do not differ about it. Has anybody ever heard a Muslim scholar say, actually, you know, you don't have to respect your parents? Has anybody ever said, nobody said, said that. You find other matters and there's always a khilaf, there's always a difference of opinion. In fact, it was, uh, there was another scholar from Mauritania, a uh, famous scholar, and he was very, very knowledgeable. But his father didn't really have so much knowledge. So he knew that people are going to come up to the father. And what do you think that the, the people, after knowing the knowledge of the son, what are they going to expect from the father? Same knowledge. Same knowledge, right? Oh, this is your son. You must have taught him. But he was a simple man, good Muslim. So his son gave him away. He said, look, I know people are going to come and they're going to ask you, you know, about things. Just always respond, fihi khilaf. <laughs> there's a difference of opinion. And he said, and that just said, Fihi khilaf. you know, there's a difference of opinion and you don't have to uh, say anything to them. So then they came to the scholar, Muhtar al Muna. They said, Muhtar, we're, we're worried about your father. He said, why? He said, we asked him about Allah. And he said, Fihi khilaf. <laughs> there's a difference of opinion. And Muhtar, being the scholar that he is, he said, yes. The Christians say this, the Jews say this, and the Muslims say this, which is the correct opinion. Now, not all khilaf is mu'tabah, not all khilaf, not all difference of opinion is a valid difference of opinion. So that's what you have difference of opinion, but then there has to be a valid difference of opinion that's based on ijtihad. But this matter of the bit of bitter is, um, uh, by consensus of the ulama, it's in the sunnah. One of the hadith Muhammad Mawlud uh, mentions here, and it's uh, related in Sahih al-Bukhari, a man came to the Prophet Now look at, look at the, the, the context of this hadith. He came to the Prophet and he said, uh, he doesn't mention the, the entirety of the hadith here, but he asked him, he said, I came, I made hijrah to come to you. Now imagine that, for those of you who have been to Medina, or want to go to Medina. You know the feeling that we get when we're on the way, or that we want to be there, or when we're there. Now here is a man who's living at the time of the Prophet He's alive. And we should also remember that during those early years, Hijrah was actually an obligation. Like if you became Muslim in some badia of, of the Arabian Peninsula and you heard about the Prophet before the conquest of Mecca, you actually, part of your Islam is you had to become Muslim and then make Hijrah to Medina. 
And then after the conquest of, the, uh, of Mecca, there was the famous hadith the Prophet ﷺ said, لا هجرة بعد الفتح After the conquest of Mecca, that obligation of making hijrah to me is no longer uh, an obligation. So it was like, you're Muslim, yes, pray five times, pay your zakat, make your Ramadan, and make your hijrah to Medina. It was a burgeoning community just starting. It was very important for the Muslims to come there to learn and so forth. So this man makes hijrah. There's an obligation there. There's the love that a person, how many of us, if we if we were alive at the time of the Prophet and would want to see him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He makes hijrah. And then he said, I came to give, to make hijrah to you, to give bay'ah to you, allegiance to you, and to fight jihad with you. Imagine all of these amazing things. What did the Prophet sallallahu respond? He said, Allah hayyun walidak, are either of your parents alive? And he said, he said, no. He said, فَفِيهِمَا فَجَاهِدْ He said, go back and do your jihad with your parents. Now look at this. Did he say, I am Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Did he say, I am the most worthy of service from the Muslims? Did he say, I am the best, so be with me? He said, are either, and he didn't say, are both of your parents alive? This is part of the when the when the, the ulama look at a hadith, they don't just look at the, the outward of the hadith, they say look at all of the different contexts of the hadith. There's a hadith mentioned in the Shama' al Imam al Tirmidhi where the Prophet came into the house of Anas who used to do his service. His younger brother had a pet bird. And the Prophet saw him and he was sad, so he asked him what uh, what had ha he asked about the house, he said, why is uh, Umayyad sad? And he said, they said, oh, his pet bird had passed away. So then he went up to him in the famous hadith, Ya Aba Umayyad, ma fa'ala al-ghayr. Oh, oh, Aba Umayyad, what did the little bird do? Ya Aba Umayyad, ma fa'ala al-ghayr. Five words. Now somebody might mention, oh, the pro you know, uh, in fact, um, one of the I believe it was, yes, it was It was not even the Orientalists. One of the early Muslims, one of the deviant Muslims, had criticized the Hadith scholars. He said, why do you spend so much time um, collecting every bit of information about the Prophet Wasallam? There's got to be some things that don't have any point. So they said, well, give us an example. He said, look, there's a Hadith you Hadith collectors have mentioned about a little boy whose bird died. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ just said, Oh, uh, yeah, Abu Umayyad, ma fa'al al what did the little bird do? You know, he was trying to make him feel good about uh, and get his mind off this, this trouble. He said, that hadith, the ulama have, have, have deduced from it over 300 rules. Just from that hadith. Think about it. That was in Medina. The little boy had a pet bird. Something he had caught in the wild. What's an issue there? Wild bird, Medina. Not pursued from the animals. You're not supposed to take from the wild creatures of the trees. In the Haram of Mecca and Medina, you can't cut down a tree, can't hunt an animal, right? It's that it's a haram, it's a precinct, it's a sanctuary. So they said, Oh, this is a this is a, this is a um, 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 uh, an exception, according to some of the ulama, that you can you can't kill the bird, but you can have it as a pet. See the distinction that's made? Also the recommendation that when you go into a house or when you meet people. Don't just greet the adults in the house. Greet the little children. Ask the little children. Because the Prophet ﷺ came into the house of, uh, of, of, uh, of Anas' family. And he didn't just ask about the father or the mother. He was asking about the little boy. And notice this. Something, some notice. Notice if, if, if you go to a group of men and one of the fathers like has their son with them. Notice how many people will say, Assalamu alaikum, and shake hands of everybody and skip over the little kid. Have you ever seen that? Skip over. He's, he's a human being. He's a Muslim. In fact, he's in a better state. We mentioned that last week. Muhammad Maulud used to only drink tea with children, not with adults. Why? Because the children don't have sin. It's like, I don't want to waste my time with sinners. I want to be with the little children who, who don't have sin. So this is, um, uh, and then just the, the, the consideration. And for those of you who have parents, don't the little children notice those type of things? They'll go back. Why didn't he say salam to me? Do I not exist? So it's a consideration for the youngest amongst us because they have they, they have a perception. And even if they're very young, those type of things 
uh, impact their growth and the, their, their, their development. So going back to this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, oh, in fact, uh, there's another story where Ahmed ibn Hanbal uh, one time was visited by Imam al-Shafi'i. And Ahmed ibn Hanbal's daughter had heard a lot about Imam al-Shafi'i, so she said, I'm interesting, you know, who is this person that everybody talks about? So she observed him when he had visited her, her, uh, the father. The next day the father said, what did you notice about him? And this was the status of the Salaf. Imam Ali, of course he's a Sahabi, he's before the Salaf. People asked him, how long does it take you to figure a person out? He said, إِذَا تَكَلَّمَ فَمِنْ سَاعَتِهِ If he speaks, then immediately I'll know what he, where, where he stands in line with the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if he doesn't, give me a day. I'll watch his actions and I'll see how close or how far he is from the son of the Messenger of Allah. And Ibn al-Hajj in the Madhul, he mentions to illustrate this, he said there was, a, there was, a, there was a, a student who studied with another teacher and he went to visit another sheikh and the sheikh invited him for a meal. They both sat down, they said Bismillah, they ate with their right hands and then the sheikh asked the student, he said, uh, who is your sheikh, who is your teacher? And he said, sheikh, please, uh, please pardon me, I have a, a toothache on the right side of my mouth. That was their only interaction in that situation. They sat down to eat a meal. The chef says, who's your teacher? And the, and the student says, pardon me, chef, I have a toothache on the left side of my, on the right side of my mouth. What happened there, is the chef is observing him. And he's noticing, okay, he sat on the ground, he ate with his hand, he ate with three fingers. Because there's a lot of adab of eating the food. Muhammad Maudud has an entire book just on the adab of eating food. And it's not just sitting on the ground and using your hand. It's very specific how the Prophet ﷺ sipped the drink, how he ate the food, with which fingers. Not the whole, it's not even the whole fingers, it's just the three fingers and the tips of those fingers. Um, so it's not like, you know, how some people were like, oh, sunnah to eat with the hands. And they start grabbing and, you know, making a ball and throwing it up. That's not the sunnah. There's a sunnah, and there's the sunnah of the sunnah. Like how exactly it's done. That's how particular the sahaba were in their observations, and they passed it down through the generations. So he had noticed that the student took the first bite and chewed it on the left side of his mouth, which the sunnah is to begin with the first bite on the right side. But he didn't say, why did you start with the left side? He said, why? Uh, he said, who is your shaykh? And the student immediately understood. He understood the sheikh is asking, who is my sheikh? Because he found all of the, the sunnahs, I'm following it, but he saw me start chewing on the left side, and so he immediately responded, he said, excuse me, I have a toothache on the right side of my mouth. That's how you know, conscious they were on the, the, the very fine sunnahs of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Imam al-Shafi'i was observed by the daughter of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. In the morning, Ahmed ibn Hanbal asked his daughter, he said, what do you think, you know, what did you observe? She said, he ate a lot of food, and he went to sleep, and he got up for Fajr, and he didn't make wudu. Like, I'm not really impressed. So Ahmed ibn Hanbal is now interested. He didn't notice those things, so he asked him. He said, as for eating a lot of food, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in the hadith that if you're with the righteous, the, the generous people, eat a lot of food because there's there's a lot of blessing in that food of the generous people. And he said, if you're with the misers, don't eat a lot of their food. But if you're with the generous, so he said, I was just following the sunnah by eating a good good, good amount uh, of, of food. He said, and as for not praying, uh, make, making wudu for fajr, he said, I made wudu for isha, I prayed isha, and I stayed the whole night eating of the hadith, Ya Aba Umayr, ma fa'alan nuhayr. Oh, Aba Umayr, what did the little bird do? And I got out so many rulings and wisdoms and, and, and recommendations and sunnahs from that one hadith. So when I got up to pray Fajr, I still had wudu. So that was Imam al-Shafi. So going back to this, uh, this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ had asked the man, are either of your parents, are either of your parents alive? Now he didn't say, are both of your parents alive? And the other thing they mention about this hadith, they say, he did not ask them, are your parents Muslim? Because at that time, the majority of people were still coming to Islam, so it was very likely that if a person became Muslim, his parents were not Muslim. So he didn't say, are your parents Muslim? Are they alive? Okay, go, go back and serve them. Do your jihad with, you, with your parents. No, he said, are either of them alive? That's it. Yes, fafihi ma fajahad. Go back and do jihad. So think about that. He sent somebody away from him and from Hijrah to Medina, and living in Medina, and allegiance to the Messenger of Allah, and Jihad with him, 
to go serve his parents. That's the status of, of Bidr al Um Now at the end, this is um, uh, one of the questions that I get. You can see this is a, starting to be a heavy, a heavy text, right? Is it? Or just very, there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot of lessons that are here. One of the common questions that I get at the end, after people say, okay, I, I understand, I understand the importance, but what about, what about, what about if my parents neglected me? Or if they, what about if my parents had neglected me? It looks like the battery is low. My parents neglected me or abused me. How do I do that? And so, when the once the Prophet وسلم, was, you hear me in the back? You know? Um, you have to change this button. Yeah. While we're waiting for that, any questions so far on what I've presented? Just directly, not general questions, but so far, just of what I've covered. While I'm waiting for that. So, the Prophet وسلم, once was, was explaining this to the Sahaba, the importance of respecting the parents. And the Sahaba had a question. They said, in lama, even if they are oppressive to the, the to the son, and he said, or the child, he said, in lamahu, in lamahu, in lamahu, even if they're oppressive, even if they're oppressive, even if they're oppressive. There's a lot of depth in that. And recently, you know, one of the, the famous people who, who has just become Muslim. Has anybody heard Sinead O'Connor? She became Muslim last year. And now she just recently came on a talk show with her hijab and so forth. So I came across a. Um, okay, don't worry. Okay, thank you. So I came across another video of a few years, and she she suffered a lot through her life. You know, a lot of people they look at the rich and famous and they think, oh, look at they got so much. You know, they got everything they want, but their lives are very. Look at some of the most famous people. Who's who's the king of pop? Michael Jackson. Did he seem to have a happy life at the end of his life? Money, the entire world knew him. I mean, he could go to Russia and fill up an entire stadium. They, even if they don't know English, they're listening. How much, how much impact did he have on the culture? How many? I remember growing up in Jordan in the eighties, people would buy the gloves, the jackets. The, remember the red jacket from Thriller, right? I mean, he uh, had a lot of people follow him, and look what he he, he wound up miserable at the end of his life. Um, the king of rock and roll. Elvis, which interestingly enough, on a side note, I know this is the message we shouldn't be talking about a lot of the malahi and so forth, but there were actually people before Elvis who had started the genre of rock and roll because it was a mixture of country music, the blues, and jazz. And where, where do all those, well, the country, you know where the country music come from, but the blues and jazz, that's from the deep south. So the genre of rock and roll was actually started before Elvis by African Americans. But at that time, America was very racist. So who was the person who found Elvis Presley? The Colonel, right? And so he said, this is in his words, he said, I need somebody who can sing that genre of music, sing the music that, that, that has been created by African Americans, but is white, so that I can sell this to people. And that's what he did. Now, subhanAllah, the, the way that the Colonel found Elvis Presley, because he was a poor boy from, from Tupelo, Mississippi. Nobody knew, was that? The colonel is his manager. Oh, I see. The colonel, what's his name? Colonel. The colonel. The colonel. The colonel. So yeah, not, not Sanders from uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> yeah. um, so the colonel uh, was at a recording studio. He's just seeing who's coming into the studio. Elvis comes up from Mississippi to Memphis, Tennessee to go to the recording studio to do what? To record a, uh, because he was, a, he was doing music, to record a, um, a record to give as, his, as a gift to his mother, Bidr al He wanted to honor his mother, and look what happened. He got all this fame and fortune. So you have to think about this, you know, these, these type of things, like what is, what is the, the spiritual asbab that people take to achieve fame and success? Has anybody ever heard of Secret Santa? Not the game they do at businesses, but the real Secret Santa. He started in the 60s, or 70s, giving out $5 bills to people. He would dress up as Santa and go around and um, uh, give people, he started out with $5. And then he went to 20, then he went, by the end he was handing out $100 bills. The way he started it is that he said he was, he was homeless, he had just lost his job, it was right before Christmas. He was living in his car, 
Imagine how sad he was at that time. And he saw some, some, some people who were struggling on the street. He said, they're worse off than me. I need to give them some tzedakah, essentially, right? Charity. So he did. And he felt really good. And so he started doing that. Eventually, he became a multimillionaire uh, in a, and, and started a cable company. But it was from tzedakah that he started this, this fortune. So I'm looking at it. I'm saying, well, the, the spiritual asbab is he gave charity. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him from the generosity. Because there's certain things. You don't have to be Muslim to tap into the ghayb. If somebody is good to their parents, they're going to get a benefit from that. If somebody gives charity, they're going to get benefit from that. So, so um, but if you look at these people, Whitney Houston, Marilyn Monroe, Michael Jackson, you just you name it. Any of these very, very, very famous people, and they end up at the, the, the end of their lives, and they could be miserable. So all of that is not necessarily... The, the way to uh, uh, to success. Now, how did I start talking about your oh, Okay, so but it's interesting when famous people become Muslim, like Yusuf Islam or Sinead Obama. So she had a lot of troubles in her life, mental health issues, drug addictions, abuse of people. So there was an interview, uh, and the person said, "I want you to, um, I, uh, I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to answer as truthful as you can." So he starts asking her about her mother. And she says, my mother was a monster. My mother did this. My mother didn't, you know, didn't take care of me. I mean, just all sorts of neglect and abuse as a, as a little girl, five, six years old. And now she, even as a, as, a, as a grown woman, she's still affected by that. And so then he asked her a question. He said, if you saw her right now and you only had one minute, what would you do? And, and she, she, she already told him, she's like, she messed up my life. Like she did all of this stuff and I'm suffering now, the drug addiction, the mental health, all of this stuff because of like the abuse and neglect that I got from my mother. He said, if you had one minute, now that your mother's gone, what would you do? He said, she said, I would hug her with all my strength and tell her I loved her and say, I will take care of you. And when I saw that, I said, SubhanAllah, that's what the Prophet said. You know, there's something deep about forgiveness to even the people who oppressed you. I mean, is there, is there anybody who oppressed the Prophet ﷺ more than Quraysh? And when he came to Mecca, and one of the Sahaba, they said, al yom yom al-Malhamah, today is the day of slaughter. He said, no, al yom yom al-Marhamah, today is the day of mercy. Hind, what do we say about Hind right now? Radiallahu anha, she bit into the liver of Hamza, and she hired an assassin to kill him. But when we say when we say him, or Abu Sufyan, who led the battles at Badr and led at Uhud and and went to try to get the Muslims to stop uh, being accepted at, at, by the Najashi in Habasha, what do we say about Abu Sufyan now? Radiallahu anhu. That's the power of Islam and forgiveness in the Prophet Sallallahu and forgiving people. So now we're going to get into this. This doesn't mean that we become. Uh, well, we'll get into it to, to more. It doesn't mean that no matter what your parents do, you just have to be, you know, take everything. Sometimes, even if the parents are um, uh, abusive or neglective toward the, the, the child, might have to move away. Part of the bit of the, bit of the, the child doesn't mean you're right there in their face. You could do bit with a phone call, with an email, with a card, with an e-card. There's lots of different ways that you can show respect. There's not just one. And you don't want to put yourself in a place where you're being humiliated. One of the hadith the Prophet said, المؤمن لا يذل النفس The believer does not allow him or herself to become humiliated. So anytime a person is humiliated, what do we have to do? We make hijrah. Doesn't matter. And that's part of maintaining the human dignity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in human beings. That we are a noble creature and we react to generosity and honoring. If somebody honors you, Thank you. How many of you know people who may be atheists, but if they were kind to you, you're like, I can work with this guy. But if there's a Muslim who prays here in the Hajjah at Fajr, and does, uh, you know, before Fajr, and prays Fajr in the first line with the Imam, but his interactions with people is just, and you don't want to be around. You don't want to do business with him. You don't want to, how many of us have had that type of interaction? So we're not talking about our, our closeness or proximity to people or like that person who's, who prays Fajr and is a person of Tawheed and believes in Allah. So spiritually and by Iman, we're, we're super close to that person. But in terms of human interaction and our, re, our re reaction to that person and our interaction with them, we're closer to this other person that respects us. And that's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in Bani Adam.
We have ennobled Bani Adam. So if anybody, including the parent, is, is humiliating people, well, it's time to make hijrah and do your bir from far away with what's ever safe. We're gonna, I'm going to get into that because he's, he, Muhammad Gondu touches on this on this topic. Um, I yes. have a question about <laughs> Hazrat Abu Bakr also had his father in Makkah. Yes. But there the Prophet didn't say go back to Makkah to serve your father. Oh, good question. So the, the, the question was about Hazrat Abu Bakr. His father was in was in Mecca and he did not tell him to go back. I never thought about it from that angle. But one of the, the things that we talked about last week is there's multiple hadith that are mentioned by the Prophet where he said the best of actions is prayer. The best of actions is bitter wadi name. And, and the best of actions is hadith. They don't contradict each other. It's for each individual person. Like he would respond to a person appropriate to their situation because he can see what they're going through. And so this person, he's saying what's best for him is to, you know, is to go back and, and serve him. Um, and so his, his, his advice to people was not one size fits all. And that's something we have to remember about, you know, when we, when, for ourselves. And also when we're around other people, it's not this deen. There are certain things that it's, yes, one size fits all. Everybody has to pray five times a day, make your, pay your zakat, make hajj, do uh, fasting, and so forth. But then there's certain elements that a person might have a strength in one area, and we encourage that. Um, the, the, what was the last thing we were mentioning right before that? Uh, there's a final point I wanted to talk about. Okay, yes, so so in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, If you were harsh and hard-hearted with the people, what would the people do? They would have run away from you. And this is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So sometimes we have to remember about themselves and feel like, well, I'm your dad, you know, I'm your boss, I'm your husband, I'm your wife, you know. Mentioning all of those stations that we have, right? They're like the, the stations of, of, of power, like, or the uh, demanding respect. Well, what station is there higher than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And Allah is telling him, look, human, he's, he's telling us something about human nature. You, the best of creation, the best of the messengers, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all of them, that if Musa alayhi wa sallam or Isa alayhi wa sallam was alive at his time, he would have to believe in him and follow him to be able to get into Jannah. He, if he was harsh and hard-hearted, people would have run away from him. So people, human beings, we have to remember that. That we have this, this nobility about us and we don't allow people to walk all over us. Um, so now he begins with the definition of guru. So we say biru al-walidin. What does it mean? He says the definition of guru or how to achieve bir, the righteousness. And this word, there's, there's various words in Arabic that don't have one single Translation. So how many of us, when we try to explain the, the concept of taqwa, we're like, what's the word? Like, what's, what, how would you explain taqwa? How would somebody translate it? Taqwa. Consciousness of Allah. Fear of Allah. You know, you see, it. what's that? There's a lot of translations. And the reason why there's a lot of translations is because it's what's called in Arabic, kalimatun jami'ah. It's a comprehensive word. And so you can you actually need a, a few lines to explain what this is. And there's there's various words that, that have this meaning. One of them is falah. So when the muaddin says hayya ala salah, prayer, that's clear. Come to the prayer. Hayya ala falah, come to success. What's the success? The success is every type of success that you can imagine. Bir, same thing. It's a kalima to jamia. It's a comprehensive word. So it means every type of righteousness. So how do we achieve that? With the parents. He said, it's with the way you speak to them, with the tongue. So one way of doing better day is with the tongue, one is with the heart, one is with the body, and one is with the uh, with your wealth. And he's got, he has a chapter on each one of these. So he starts with the, the how do you speak to the, the parents. So he said, the, the way we speak to them is that you speak to them soft speech and again i mentioned last week one of the ayahs that has a lot of lessons of bitter wadi dain is uh, in surah al-isra 17 23 to 25. so even if you haven't if you don't plan on memorizing many surahs or many ayahs if you just memorize those three ayahs you'll get a, 
the, the basically the whole essence of bin al in those few ayahs. Well, one of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us is to speak to them the qawlin layhi. In one ayah it says, وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا It says the way to speak to them is by saying a kareem speech. And another one it says to say قَوْلًا لَيِّنَا to, but what does this mean? So it says a an a uh, karima, an honorable speech, or a layin speech, a soft speech. Okay, uh, a soft speech. One of the salaf was asked. They said, okay, what exactly does qawla layin mean? And it was uh, yeah, Ibn al Musayyib was asked. He says, ma had al qawla karima. Actually, sorry, it's not the layin. Wa qulhuma qawla karima, the honorable speech. So if we say, what is the honorable speech? How do you honor? Everybody, that's subjective. It's not objective. We need a definite way of, what does it mean to honor your parents in speech? And so Ibn Musayyib was asked, what does this actually mean? He says, قَوْلِ الْعَبْدِ الْمُذْنِبْ لِلْسَيِّدِ الْفَضْلِ الْغَلِيرِ The state, the, the way a, a slave who has committed a crime would speak with his harsh and majestic master. The way a slave who has committed a crime would speak with his harsh and majestic master. Now you get two extremes in this example. You get the extreme of power dynamics. Master and his slave. And it's not a nice slave. He's actually a harsh slave. He, uh, sorry, a harsh master. A harsh master, and he's not just harsh, he actually has a majestic presence. And this slave is very lowly, and he's actually committed something that the mate would make the master angry. So imagine, he's, he's got the aspect element of slave, he's a slave, he's lowly in his, he's not a very, you know, uh, uh, majestic person in his personality. And the third is that he's, he's actually done something bad. And the master has uh, three other qualities. He's the master in the relationship, and he's majestic in his presence, and he's very harsh and hard-hearted. Now how would that person speak with his master? And Ibn al-Musayyib, one of the famous tabi'een, sorry, the tabi'een, he said, that's the qawla al That's how. Now compare that with what we see today. Compare that with what, and I'm talking about across societies. Muslim, non-Muslim, you go to a store. Has it ever, like, really, have you cringed when you hear kids talking to their parents? Right now, we're not we're not saying we're not the, the, the whole sunnah of this of respecting the parents is not to create a master slave relationship with parent child. That's not what we're talking about. And he's giving a mubalagha. So uh, the story that I give to when I teach this to kids, I change. I said, imagine a harsh, majestic general, and I use general and soldier because then they can. Oh yeah, general and soldier, right? And the soldier threw a ball through the window, and you know he cracked the window, and he hit the. The, the general on the head and the kids start laughing. Um, now when he comes in, how is he going to talk to the master? Or the general in that situation? So it gives them it gives them a picture of like, oh, I get it. This We're not like equals, like what this society is trying to teach, you know, like everybody's equal. No, there is some difference. So that's the the, the Qawl al-Kareem, according to Ibn al-Musayyim. And then he says, you give nasiha to your parents as well. Give them advice. So part of the bid, part of your respect to your parents is that you give them advice. And nasiha is in deen and dunya. In the famous hadith of the Prophet he said, ad-deen nasiha Deen is giving good advice. And this would be about the, the deen matters or the dunya matters. But there's a few, there's a few rules to giving nasiha. Um, nasiha is different than Amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi an munkar One of the descriptions of the believers is that wa ya'muruna bil ma'ruf wa yanhawna 'anil munkar They enjoy righteousness and they forbid evil. But what are the conditions? Does this mean you can just go up to anybody and say whatever you want? No, there's three conditions to enjoying righteousness and forbidding evil. One is that you have knowledge. You actually know this. How many of us have come up to that well-intending brother or sister or when we were younger, that well-intending uncle or auntie in the masjid to give us advice about what we were doing or what we were not doing? We've all had experiences like that. Or maybe in our workplace or somebody just giving you the unsolicited advice. There's somebody who said unsolicited advice is the junk mail of advice. 
So they give you this unsolicited advice, and sometimes it's like, what are you talking about? You don't know. So the person has to have knowledge. They actually have to know what is the rule about this matter, and that there's no difference of opinion. There's no valid difference of opinion. The second thing is that they actually have to know that this will benefit the person. If, if it's not going to make any difference, you know, the point is not just to have people go out there and say, oh, that's haram, and that's wise, and you shouldn't do that, and that's sunnah, and that's what you do. It's not the point, because then if we had to mention that about every single person, we, would, we, would, we, we couldn't handle it. And so the other thing is that it has to be, uh, there has to be a uh, um, a belief that it will actually benefit the person for it to be an obligation. And the third is that it will not lead to a greater harm. So an example they mention when they talk about enjoining righteousness and forbidding evil, is they say if a person is drinking alcohol, they have a weapon in their hand, and you go up to them and you say, oh, that's haram, and he does something with the weapon, what's worse, the drinking of the alcohol or him hurting somebody? So just watch out for that. But I, would, I usually use a, an example that's more relevant. There's situations where people can actually be chased away from the deen or actually leave the deen of Islam because people are just always on them. And I've heard you know, stories of, of people that they, this, this actually has happened to them. They just they couldn't handle it. Every, they come to the masjid, it's supposed to be a place of, you know, you're connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's just this person, oh, you're doing that wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. And if you don't have the, 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 the steadfastness to take that, it could shake a person. And there have been people who have left Islam because of that. I know the stories. I've heard some, and I'm sure other people have stories as well. Or somebody who, I remember one time my father, this is in a masjid here in the Bay Area. A brother took his shahada, at, uh, like after Jummah, and uh, or right before Jummah, and right after the prayer, he's making his salah, and he's not sitting in the prayer, the sunnah style. Because that's a difficult, right? If you look at the people in front of you, most people, right, we sit on chairs now, and we're always at our desk, so we don't have the flexibility. Um, that we that, that, that young children have, for example. So somebody came up to him while he's in prayer and started twisting his foot so that it's in the sunnah style. This person literally just took his shahada, and you're worried about the sunnah style. Or another sister who um, uh, she came to to a person who was an imam at that masjid at the time. She she's a young sister, 16 or 17. She became Muslim. Her family didn't know she became Muslim because she would actually be kicked out of her house if they found out she was Muslim. Now let me ask you this, a 16 or 17 year old girl in our society, if she's kicked out on the streets, isn't that a life 